Welcome back! Today I have a rather random lineup of villains to rank. But you guys voted for it, so without further ado, let's jump in. No, 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 spoilers! Spoiler warning! So today we are talking about the Lord Commander from Final Space, Toffee from Star vs. the Forces of Evil, and finally the Devil from the Cuphead show. So spoilers for all three shows. I'll be using the same criteria as the previous videos, judging the villains on character design, personality, powers and abilities, presence, effect on the protagonist, actions, and of course their conclusions. First, let's start with the Lord Commander. The Lord Commander is a space dictator who leads a giant army with one goal, to open final space and to ascend to being a titan. But to accomplish this, first he must find this little guy, Mooncake, who our heroes are protecting. Design. The Lord Commander may not seem intimidating at first glance. <laughs> hear about this but looks can be deceiving and many make this mistake some upon seeing him find his size funny and underestimate him which causes him to lash out showing how ruthless he is he doesn't look as openly evil as villains like bellos from the owl house and the court from amphibia but with his face alone we know he's not a good guy he always looks pissed off and if he does smile there's no mistaking the dark intent behind it my favourite aspect of the Lord Commander's design is over the story, he starts to decay. The Lord Commander is dying from his powers, so the more he uses them, the more he starts to fall apart. And the more he decays, the more he looks like the monster he is inside. You can just tell the character designers had a lot of fun making him look completely messed up. The Lord Commander has another form. In the ending of Season 3, the Lord Commander finally achieves his goal of becoming a Titan. And bro, he is one ugly dude. Just look at that veiny head, ugh, gross. But personal biases aside, this design does look like a beefed up version of his normal form. So it does a good job at showing us the Lord Commander in a more powerful form. Overall, I'll give the Lord Commander a 2 out of 5 for design. He's not bad, but his looks aren't his strongest attributes. He is a little bit plain. Personality. The Lord Commander is probably the most openly evil villain I've reviewed so far. In his first scene alone, he very brutally kills a random guy by breaking all of his limbs and feeding him to his henchmen, so right off the bat, we see he's not to be messed around with. The Lord Commander has zero regard for life, taking life over minor things like giving him the wrong size biscuits. Why don't I like the much littler kind of biscuits? Or just killing every prisoner, so he has the prison to himself, for a dramatic reveal. I spent many hours of my day planning this. Everyone and the entire prison was murdered for this surprise. Moments like this really reveal how he views himself. He truly believes he is superior to everyone and everything. We see in the Lord Commander's backstory that he was a decent normal guy at one point. But on a mission, he got too close to the gate to final space, and Titan's energy connects with him, giving him his powers. In this moment, you can see he changes. Being picked by a Titan, having the powers, he thinks he has ascended being a mere mortal. The Lord Commander's ultimate goal is to become a Titan. He thinks he has the right to become a godlike entity, so he doesn't respect or care about anything else, making it easier for him to disregard life. I mean, just look at his name, the Lord Commander. He clearly is very full of himself. Another one of the Lord Commander's most prominent traits is how impatient he is. He is desperate to unlock final space and will stop at nothing to get there, causing him to have very little patience for anyone who gets in his way. A lot of his impatience comes from the fact that his powers are killing him, causing him to need Mooncake as soon as possible. But even before that he was impatient, causing him to lash out often. The fact that he is so desperate to achieve his goal makes him more terrifying because he has nothing to lose and he will stop at nothing to get it. Another interesting part of the Lord Commander's personality is that he's slightly juvenile. Sometimes he acts a little childish. To put it in his own words, Is this a game? I love games. But despite his love of games, there's nothing innocent about it. He loves toying his enemies with these games, finding a dark satisfaction in their fear. Overall, the Lord Commander isn't the deepest character. He's not really that complex, but he is a great opponent. He's one of the darkest and most brutal villains I've raided. He has zero regard for life and is extremely determined, making him an extremely dangerous presence. Plus, I don't really know where else to add this in, but he's voiced by David Tennant. That is actually wild to me. He does such an amazing job at sounding pure evil. 
So I'll give the Lord Commander a 4 out of 5 for personality. His constant evil presence plays off our lighter characters really well, leading to great interactions. Powers and Abilities The Lord Commander's main ability is Telekinesis. The Lord Commander is very strong in his telekinesis, being easily able to use it at first. He is very aggressive with his power, using it to torture and mutilate people. He's also able to easily take down creatures that tower over him. On top of this, he can use his telekinesis to fly. The Lord Commander also has some psychic powers, being able to forcibly enter people's minds. And he seems to be able to possess slash control Little Cardo's mind, leaving Little Cardo his puppet. Death is sweeter than life. I don't know why more kids aren't named Death is Sweeter Than Life. Outside of his powers, the Lord Commander, as his name suggests, commands a huge army, having a giant army at his disposal. He has so many people in his control that he feels free to kill them over minor errors, like being served the wrong sized cookie. Biscuits. On top of this, he is also in control of the Infinity Guard, which is an intergalactic space organization dedicated to protecting the galaxy. So basically he owns the space police. Later in the series, the Lord Commander gains the form of a Titan, so this would grant him far more power. It's not fully known what the Titan is capable of, but we know they have super powerful telekinesis mind powers. They are super strong, and they are giants that seem to be able to manipulate their body into whatever they want, as shown when the Lord Commander turns his arm into a blade to kill Bolo. He probably has even more powers considering the Titans seem to be some of the most powerful beings in the universe. So overall, I'll be giving the Lord Commander a pretty high score, even though in his normal form, he mostly just uses telekinesis. But it's more the way he uses it. With this one power, he uses it to its full potential. Now, some of you might be saying the Lord Commander's powers are slowly killing him, so he should get a lower score. But I would disagree. Despite slowly dying, the Lord Commander never really slows down using his power. He still wields enormous strength, and the fact that he's dying only motivates him to use his power even more to get what he wants. So I'll be giving the Lord Commander a 3.5 for power. The way he wields his power and his resources makes him an enormous threat, despite his size. You're so tiny, man! Presence. The Lord Commander appears in the first episode where he immediately shows us how much of a threat he is. He then appears in every episode of season one, being very involved in the plot, constantly pursuing our heroes. They are never truly safe from him. He's a constant looming threat. He drives so much of the story, and the weight of his actions can be felt everywhere. Gary even loses his arm to the Lord Commander, giving us a constant reminder of him. The Lord Commander is very present throughout the story. Then in Season 2, he dies for the first time. So we have a bit of a break from the Lord Commander in Season 2. But as he dies, we get an ominous voice saying, Our work isn't done, child. It's only just begun. Leaving us to wonder when he will return. Then, in Season 3, we get the Lord Commander's return, resurrected and more powerful than ever, working for Invictus. But the Lord Commander isn't content being a lackey. So taking the body of a Titan, the Lord Commander reminds us who the big bad is. Overall, I think the Lord Commander has great presence throughout the show, feeling very involved in the plot. He feels like a constant threat, so his impact can be seen in most parts of Final Space's universe, so I'll give him a 4 out of 5 for presence. Effects on the Protagonist the Lord Commander has a very obvious and direct effect on Gary. He rips off his arm. You idiot! That's my freaking arm! You just ripped off my arm! Ah! Oh my God! That's a pretty obvious effect, but aside from the arm, how is Gary affected by the Lord Commander? Well, Gary is a character who isn't driven by anger or fear of the Lord Commander. What really drives Gary is his relationships, his connections to his friends. While yes, Gary worries about the Lord Commander as a constant threat, I would argue it's not his main motivation. So the deepest impact that the Lord Commander has on Gary is when he takes his friends away from him. Major spoilers, the Lord Commander kills Gary's best friend, Avocado. This is by far the most shocking and sudden moment in Final Space. We have seen Avocado and Gary's friendship grow, so to have him ripped away devastates Gary. I think it's one of the first times we truly see Gary's hatred grow. Even when the Lord Commander takes his arm, he seems more pissed off than actually despising him. But this isn't the main effect he has on Gary. Gary is forced into a position now to take care of Avocado's son, while also dealing with his own pain. The Lord Commander also takes Mooncake from Gary, and in the end, Gary will stop at nothing to save him. The Lord Commander is good at getting at people through others, but honestly, of the main characters, Gary is probably the least affected by the Lord Commander, 
which is crazy since he loses his arm to the guy. Little Cardo, Avocado's son, is easily the most traumatized by the Lord Commander. He kills his father, which obviously affects him on a much deeper level than Gary. Little Cardo is blinded by rage, acting recklessly, and before this, the Lord Commander kidnapped Little Cardo and used him as bait for Avocado. He tricks Little Cardo into summoning Avocado and Gary to get Mooncake. Out of all the candidates to be the most deeply emotionally affected by the Lord Commander, it just has to be Little Cardo. It's non-stop pain and torment for the little guy. But someone who is just as affected by Little Cardo is regular Cardo. The Lord Commander turns Avocado into a monster, using Little Cardo to control Avocado and turn him into an extremely ruthless monstrous general for his army. The Lord Commander even forces Avocado to kill his son, but when he refuses, he takes him away. This eventually turns Avocado into a revenge-obsessed hunter, doing everything possible in his power to save his son and take revenge on the Lord Commander, and that will eventually take his life. The Lord Commander causes chaos everywhere. Everyone in the universe is affected by his mission to access Final Space. Even characters who barely interact with him are affected by him. The Lord Commander is in charge of the Infinity Guard. Once Quinn finds this out, everything she stood for is robbed from her. The people she fought were heroes were just a facade caused by the Lord Commander. It's clear that no one can escape the Lord Commander's effects. His chaos touches everyone, so I'll give him a 4 out of 5 for effects on the protagonists. Actions. The Lord Commander has a very extensive list of horrible actions. Many I've already mentioned. For starters, he kills so many randos, like this guy. Please don't kill me! And this guy. I like the much littler kind of biscuits. He also kills everyone in this prison. Everyone and the entire prison was murdered! So yeah, he just loves killing. He also orders all of his generals to kill their firstborn, so that's pretty fucked up. He even eventually takes down Bolo, the titan that's aiding our heroes. Ooh. And of course, he kills our boy Avocado, which is obviously the worst murder we see him commit. Again, as previously mentioned, he kidnaps Little Cardo and later takes control of his mind. He rips off Gary's arm, which is obviously a very noteworthy evil deed. One very evil deed I haven't previously mentioned is how the Lord Commander kidnaps Mooncake and uses him to open the gate to Final Space, which results in the Earth being taken to Final Space. That's right, he gets the whole world stolen. But speaking of the Earth, it's already in ruins and abandoned because of the breach in space that the Lord Commander is creating. And later on in Season 3, he completely destroys the Earth when his Titan form hatches out of the Earth. So yeah, the Earth is an egg, and I thought it was bad in Doctor Who when the moon was an egg. The moon's an egg. Huh? But at least to counter all of this evil, the Lord Commander is encouraging to his employees who work well. So, keep it up. Good job, Jeff. Hearing great things. Every action the Lord Commander does reinforces his villainy. He's constantly reminding us he's a real threat. I think Final Space really benefited from being an adult show. It allowed them to show more violence. This allowed the writers to make jokes at the Lord Commander's expense, but then have a violent moment that reminds us how evil he is. Having this keeps him sort of balanced. He can be very funny, but it doesn't take away from how dark he is, since his evil moments are so dark. I'll give the Lord Commander a 4.5 for actions, because all of his actions are consistently enforcing how dark his nature is. Conclusion Does the Lord Commander have a satisfying conclusion? Well, this is kind of hard to answer because Final Space is in an unfortunate situation. Since the show was cancelled, there isn't really a proper ending yet. There will be an ending in the graphic novel that Olin Rogers is making, but more on that later. So instead, I'll cover his ending in Seasons 2 and his other ending in Season 3. At the beginning of Season 2, there isn't much left of the Lord Commander. Over Season 1, his use of his power slowly kills him, and we see how broken he is now. The Lord Commander is coughing and spluttering on his ship as it drifts in the ruins of the final battle of Season 1. The Lord Commander successfully won. He opened the rift to final space, but it didn't go as he expected. The Titans stole the Earth, abandoning him. His powers weren't restored, his body wasn't healed, and he didn't ascend to be a Titan. He's left with Mooncake to wallow in his regrets. He desperately tries to reopen the gate, but it's no use. Mooncake has no energy left to give. Nightfall approaches the Lord Commander, she throws a spear straight into the Lord Commander. She goes on to monologue how she's done this many times in many different universes. It's not really an aggressive speech, it's more of a side note, 
The Lord Commander's probably barely even hearing this, since he's struggling and in so much pain. Quinn gives the Lord Commander a message to give to Invictus, and before he can respond, she finishes it, leaving behind an extremely mangled corpse. This is a really satisfying ending. There's no big fight, there's no famous last words, just a brutal end. Nightfall didn't even defeat him. She was honestly probably doing him a favor by mercy killing him. If she wasn't there, he still would have died. He was his own downfall. He kept pushing his powers till it killed him. He blindly believed he was divine, but in the grand scheme of things, he was just a pawn. A pawn that was discarded when his use is done. And to top it off, it's satisfying to see Nightfall take some small revenge for everything the Lord Commander has done. But when the smoke is cleared, Invictus takes the Lord Commander for later use, which results in his second ending. I think after the events of Season 2, the Lord Commander is less trusting of the Titans after this. They left him to die in Season 1, so he takes matters into his own hands and goes after Invictus himself. But he bites off more than he can chew and pays. Ash takes care of the Lord Commander swiftly. His fate is fitting. He's trapped like Bolo in the cube and sent into the unknown. He's not allowed to die, but only to suffer. Now, I doubt this is the Lord Commander's final end. He still might return in the graphic novel, but for now, that's what we have. I appreciate both endings for the Lord Commander. They're both harsh. For a being who's caused so much death and suffering, a quick death would have been letting him off the hook. Imprisonment is much more fitting. Both these endings toss him aside. For someone who thinks of himself to be so important and grand, it's good to see the show disrespect his beliefs by treating him like he's nothing. But since his ending is still in the air, it does feel a little incomplete. So I'll give him a 2 out of 5 for his conclusion. Overall, the Lord Commander is one of the deadliest, most ruthless villains I've reviewed. He's not the deepest character, but he's the textbook definition of a villain. Sometimes it's nice to have a villain who's just evil for just the sake of being evil. The Lord Commander's final score is 24 out of 35. Now, before I move on to our next villain, I just want to thank Olin Rogers, the creator of Final Space. At the time of recording, Final Space is in a tough spot. The show has been cancelled before it could even conclude, and even worse, the show has been Thanos snapped off pretty much everything. But despite this, Olin Rogers is still incredibly optimistic. He's been fighting for the rights of the show, which has allowed him to create the comic, which also has many problems in the way he's been published. But Olin never stops. He's even made a pilot for a new show, Godspeed. His endless enthusiasm and determination is incredibly inspiring. He is such an amazing person, and I encourage you to follow him and his projects. I'll leave links to his amazing work, so please, give him all the support you can, he deserves it. And now, let's move on to the next villain. Toffee from Star vs. the Forces of Evil Toffee was a breath of fresh air for Star vs. the Forces of Evil, in my opinion. Toffee is a serious, cold, calculating villain in a show that is very zany, wacky, and silly. Before Toffee arrives, the primary villain is Ludo, who at first is the textbook definition of a villain of the week. He's barely a villain of the week! Ludo is always trying to steal Star's magic wand, but he's so incompetent that he doesn't even pose a threat. There's nothing wrong with a goofy villain of the week, but the contrast between Toffee and Ludo caught my attention. Toffee started to make it feel like something was actually happening in the show. It felt like the story was starting to build up, and man, am I a sucker for ongoing storylines. But let's start with Toffee's character design. Toffee's main design is a lizard man in a business suit. His design really stands out in Star's world. The show is so colorful and energetic, so the clean suit and darker color palette really stands out. His suit is very fitting to his personality. It projects a more serious, sophisticated feel to him. A very prominent part of Toffee's design is his missing finger. It's very mysterious and intriguing, adding to the desire to know what his whole deal is. But, surprise! Like most villains on this list, this isn't Toffee's only form. Major spoiler warning, Toffee enters Star's wand and enters the realm of magic, where he starts merging with the magic himself, corrupting it, turning him into this horrifying thing. Its reveal is just perfect. A huge eye emerges from the black goo, staring down at Star. Then, two ginormous hands block her escape. A sinister smile rises up to reveal Toffee's new evil form. <laughs> the way Toffee's... <laughs> The way Toffee's liquid form moves is just creepy as, the way it stretches and slides around. He has full control over Star here. She is completely trapped and overwhelmed by him. This form fits Toffee's calculating mind. He plans everything out, trapping everyone in his grand plan. Just like this form who can literally trap and overwhelm Star. 
The dark inky form really highlights Toffee's evil expressions, giving us some of his most sinister frames yet. Overall, I'll give Toffee a 3 out of 5 for design. Toffee's design is very sharp, representing his character well, but it doesn't really personally catch my eye. It doesn't leave as much of an impact as other more dramatic villains I've ranked so far. Villains like Bill Cipher, Bellos, and The Core are extremely evil looking, and they instantly catch your eye. While yes, Toffee is still very clearly evil looking, he doesn't look as evil as he could be. Now, I know this is more personal bias, so I think a 3 out of 5 is a good middle ground for Toffee. Personality. Toffee is very sharp and charismatic. He has everything planned out, and everything is in his control, so he is always confident. One of Toffee's biggest strengths is his charisma. He knows just what to say to get into Ludo's gang. He also gains Ludo's henchmen's trust by complimenting them and showing them how incompetent Ludo is. He persuades them to kick Ludo out and make him the boss. Toffee has a very cold feel to him. He's normally straight to the point, and the tone of his voice is very flat. Since Toffee is so smart and can think so far ahead, he can't help but look down on people. Despite his cold, calculating attitude, he still clearly indulges in his dark pleasures. He revels in the idea of his revenge. Toffee is a very driven and evil being with a cold and calculating mind, capable of achieving his dark goals. Toffee was a much needed addition to Star vs. The Forces of Evil. His plan really kickstarts the ongoing story, and he added a real threat to the show. Before this, the monsters had no weight to them. There was never a point where I was worried for our main characters, but that all changed when Toffee was added. He added real stakes to the show, and he also added mystery. His plans are confusing and unpredictable. We never properly know what he's up to. That and his mysterious missing finger and unknown past left us hungry for more of that juicy, juicy law. I'll give Toffee a free for personality. It's really refreshing seeing a mature character amongst all of the wacky chaos of Star vs. The Forces of Evil. Powers and Abilities Toffee's most powerful ability is his regeneration ability. Toffee can quickly regrow any limb or organ. He loses an arm, and BAM! It's back, and just as buff as ever. What's that? A hole in your chest? Well, BAM! No problem at all, although regeneration can't help the hole in your suit now. His regeneration powers are so strong that Moon, the current queen, is forced to use Eclipse's dark corrupting magic to cancel it. She uses this to take Toffee's finger, making it unable to regenerate. Along with his regenerating powers, Toffee doesn't seem to age. Toffee looks almost the same from Moon's rule all the way up to the star's time. Maybe this is part of his regeneration power. Toffee also doesn't seem to skip the gym. Toffee seems to have above average strength, being able to take down opponents with ease. But his true strength comes from his sharp mind. As mentioned, he is a genius. He's always three steps ahead of his opponents. Toffee also uses his knowledge of magic to split star's wand in half and enter the wand. This puts Toffee in the magic realm, where he merges with the magic, slowly corrupting it. He becomes one with the corrupted magic, allowing Toffee to possess and control Ludo, who is merged with half of Star's wand. Yeah, it's a very long story. But basically, while Toffee is corrupting the magic, he can control Ludo, and later on, when he wants to leave, he can reform his body from the wand. So, what it all comes down to is, Toffee is extremely difficult to kill. His power is his unwillingness to die and his drive. Toffee has even led armies due to his intelligence and charisma. So yes, he has a lot of power, definitely more than your average schmo. So I'll give Toffee a 3 out of 5 for power. Comparing him to other characters in this list, I think that's pretty fair. He's definitely stronger than characters like Gideon from Gravity Falls or Andreas from Amphibia. They gain their powers from tools and weapons, while Toffee's powers are part of him. But he also doesn't compare to other villains like the Collector, Bill Cipher, and the Core, who are capable of destroying whole worlds in some cases. So Toffee gets a nice spot in the middle at 3 out of 5. Presence Toffee first appears in Season 1 Episode 8, Fortune Cookies, where he basically just shows up into Ludo's house and just tricks Ludo into hiring him. Where did you come from? I let myself in. When? After you hired me. I hired you? I accept. Excellent! We'll start tomorrow. It's quick and brief. He's barely even relevant to this episode. Then, over the next couple of episodes, he creeps into the show, overthrowing Ludo and becoming the big bad for the season final. Impressive since he's only in four episodes of season one. But despite his lack of appearances, he leaves a big impact. It feels like he inserted himself into the show efficiently, showing how well planned out everything is. Then, in season two, 
Toffee sort of disappears, at least that's what it seems like. In season 2, he only makes appearances in flashbacks and pictures, but his true return comes in Ludo. Ludo becomes Toffee's form for season 2. Well, at least until the end where we see what he's been up to. Despite, again, not being in season 2 much, the appearance he does make is some of the most memorable moments in the whole show. Toffee builds presence through small and sparing appearances. He's always up to something, so we always have him in the back of our minds as we watch wondering how the pieces of his plans fit together. But something more interesting to me is what happens after he dies. The impact and the ghost of Toffee's memories lingers throughout the show. He's mentioned in six episodes of season three and appears in flashbacks, but for a character who's dead, he has such a lingering presence. So I'll give Toffee a two out of five for presence. Effects on the protagonists. Toffee doesn't just affect our main character star, but her whole family. Toffee is a burden on the butterfly family. It all starts long before the events of the show itself. Star's mother, Moon, is still a child. Toffee, leading his army of monsters, kills Moon's mother, forcing her to take charge of the kingdom at 17. This forced Moon to mature fast. She has to make tough decisions. This would shape her into a strict person, who appears cold on the surface. The encounter with Toffee changed every aspect of Moon's life. It turned her into the responsible, strict, strong leader she is. And this would affect the way she parents Star. So before Star even knows who Toffee is, he's already deeply affected her. Star's mum being so strict is one of the reasons she is so rebellious. But how does he more directly affect Star? Well, for starters, he's one of the first real threats for Star. He forces Star to choose between the magic wand and Marco, testing what's really important to Star. Obviously she chooses Marco, but this choice has consequences. She has to watch the spirit of her wand die, Yes, I know the unicorn is called a mill horse, but that doesn't sound as cool as the spirit of the wand, so just deal with it. Toffee really seems to hit Star deep with the death of her wand. The show gets serious for a moment here. Well, at least until Ludo pops out of an egg. Look, nature. <laughs> but seriously, this moment definitely has a lasting effect on Star, and it also has the effect of breaking her wand, which leads to lots of different story arcs. But alone, this shows Star's true colours. It shows she's willing to sacrifice anything for the greater good, whether it's her wand, magic, or even herself. Star risks her life in her final encounter with Toffee. She activates the Whisper spell to enter the wand, and this could have killed her. So Toffee challenges her, putting her in the toughest decisions, testing her character, and revealing who she really is. Without Toffee, Star probably wouldn't have matured as fast as she did. And I honestly don't think she could have made the final decision at the end of the show without Toffee. So overall, Toffee gets a 3 out of 5 for effects on the protagonists. Actions. While Toffee is a schemer, planning every little thing out, he is also a man of action. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Toffee, as previously mentioned, leads an army of monsters against the Newmans. But on top of that, he kills Queen Comment, which is probably the evilest thing he does. Another of Toffee's evil deeds is kidnapping Marco and using him as leverage against Star. He threatens Star by having Marco almost crushed. But Toffee's evil deeds aren't just limited to our heroes. One of Toffee's biggest victims is Ludo. Toffee manipulates and controls Ludo at every turn until he takes everything from him. He takes his henchmen and he gets Ludo kicked out of his own home. But not only that, Toffee destroys Star's wand, which is one of the evilest things he does, but he does it in Ludo's castle, getting it destroyed, leaving Ludo with literally nothing. Now, all this would be bad enough, but Toffee still isn't even done with Ludo. Toffee possesses Ludo, leaving not even his mind his own. Despite Ludo being a villain, not even he deserves all this. But Toffee's most noteworthy on-screen evil deeds is his destruction of the wand. I've already talked about some of the effects destroying the wand had on Star, so I won't go over that again, just to save some time. Toffee is nothing like the Lord Commander. He kills strategically. It's always to aid his cause. But to be honest, Toffee's actions aren't as evil as some of the other villains I've ranked. He's definitely evil, but all of his evil acts are done in pursuit of a goal, to eliminate magic. It's all done in a very efficient way. He's a no-nonsense kind of guy. When he kidnaps Marco, he actually treats him pretty well, even making him a sandwich. He doesn't necessarily go out of his way to be evil, he just uses any means necessary to achieve his goal, no matter the cost, no matter how dark it gets. So I'll be giving Toffee a 2 out of 5 for actions, even compared to some of the less evil villains I've covered, he just doesn't do as much in terms of evil deeds. Conclusion Does Toffee have a good conclusion? 
Toffee ascends out of the inky black magic goo, leaving Star trapped in the magic realm. His new form grows from Ludo's wand hand in a horrific transformation. Man, it's really not Ludo's day. Toffee crushes his half of the wand, then says she's gone, and simply turns away. He's won, he's got his revenge, he's accomplished his goal, there's just nothing left to do. So he just leaves. No extra gloating, that's just it. Or at least it would have been. Moon's in a state of shock and desperation. She runs at Toffee, she struggles with him, and summons dark magic to kill him. But Toffee effortlessly and emotionlessly fends her off. When the spell doesn't work due to him corrupting the magic, he simply states, are you finished, in a cold flat tone. But then, suddenly... SURPRISE! Toffee is stabbed through the chest by Marco's hand. What? How freaking strong is Marco? But Toffee instantly heals the wound, and without a word, tosses Marco aside, showing his strength as Marco literally cracks the rock he hits. <coughs> and then he just pushes Moon into the ground. I've said it before, but... Damn, this guy does not skip the gym. He dusts off his suit and walks away, gone for good. But, surprise! It's not over. Ludo crawls at his feet, begging Toffee, please, did I have any part to play in this? Toffee is honestly a straight up savage, saying simply, no. Leaving Ludo to snivel on the ground. The end. Just kidding. While all of this has been happening, Star has reignited the magic and emerges from her wand, more powerful than ever. She has a new Mubity form. Mubity is a long story that we're not getting into. But she unleashes a furious beam of energy at Toffee. The energy melts the skin off his bones, leaving him a skeletal figure oozing goop. His ruined body crawls towards Star with his final message. <laughs> you think you've won? Ha! You don't make the plans. I do. Me. Only I. I know how this all turns out. But he's cut short by Ludo. That's what you get! I just love this ending for Toffee. His skeletal remains are horrifying. I can't believe they honestly got away with this. I also love that we see Toffee's reaction to victory. He treats it like a business transaction. Once he's achieved his goal, he's done. He doesn't even show any emotion. He doesn't brag about his revenge. He doesn't do anything. It's also ironic that Ludo takes the final blow for all of Toffee's intelligence and foresight, he didn't see the one that he underestimated the most being his downfall. But the best part is easily Toffee's final words. He claims he knows how everything will turn out. And despite dying early in season 3, he's kind of right. Toffee wanted to eliminate magic, and by the end of season 4, that's exactly what happens. Star destroys all of the magic, and in the end, she agrees with Toffee. So, in a weird way, he does win. Everything he thought would happen does happen. So I think I'll give Toffee a 4 out of 5 for his conclusion. It's fitting. He is a mastermind, and in the end, his plans outlived him. And he won. Not many villains can actually say that. Too bad he's dead. That's what you get! So overall, Toffee's final score is a 20 out of 35. Toffee is an amazing villain. Honestly, he feels too serious for Star vs. The Forces of Evil. Nothing against the show, but Toffee feels like he's from just a completely different show. I wish we had a bit more screen time of him. Despite his importance, he only has about 10 minutes of screen time, so he's not really in the show very much. I understand it's to build up his mystery, but I still would have loved for him to have a little more screen time. But overall, Toffee really is a powerful villain. In the show, he was easily one of the most noteworthy and interesting additions to Star vs. The Forces of Evil. But moving on to our next villain. Who could be more evil than our next villain, the devil himself, from The Cuphead Show? The Devil from Cuphead is interesting because his first appearance isn't from the show, but the Cuphead game. If you're familiar with Cuphead at all, you know it's a beautiful game hand-drawn and animated in the rubber hose style of the 1930s. But the game was so popular that it branched out into other mediums like books and the TV show. Like in the game, The Devil is also the big bad of the show. Design while the game was animated in the rubber hose style of the 1930s, the show wasn't. The style is expensive and slow to do, so for the show, they used puppet-based methods to replicate the rubber hose look. 
Both designs for the devil are pretty much the same. The game version is a bit darker in its tones, and in the show he's slightly more colourful, with yellow horns and a coloured nose. I think this relatively simple design for the devil is great. There are so many depictions of the devil in media and mythology. This design in Cuphead is easily recognisable as the devil, but distinct enough that it stands strong as its own interpretation of him. Something I specifically like about this design is how well it works for the different needs. In the game, the devil is scarier. He has far more sinister shots in game. For example, pretty much any time he's sitting in his throne, or his final form when he's giant, or when in his eye we can see him smashing the mugs. My personal favourite though, is when the skeleton jumps out of his skin. But while it's sinister when it needs to be, it also perfectly fits into the light-hearted situations of the show. But this isn't the devil's only form. In the game, the devil's boss fight contains many forms, and the show is no exception. The devil can shapeshift at will. Some of his common forms are a goat, a dragon, and a spider. There's lots of depictions of Satan and the devil with goats, so it makes sense that he would take this form. The dragon form could be a reference to the Book of Revelation, where Satan appears as a great red dragon, but also, I don't know, I just found this after looking up the devil connections to dragons. And as far as I can tell, the spider form is just because spiders are scary. But the devil isn't limited to these forms. He has many more. But this video is already way too long, so let's just sum it up. All of these forms are super expressive, and the transformation between them is smooth and effortless. I mean, just look at this crazy transformation. It's so expressive, showing his rage. All are using the devil's main color palette, and facial features, so we can always recognize him. Overall, despite the devil being a simple design, I think it's very effective, so I'll give the devil a 4.5 out of 5 for design. Personality. The devil's first appearance in the Cuphead show sums up the devil pretty well. He sings about how much he loves being evil. He absolutely loves being evil, relishing in the collection of souls, and doing minor evil things, like literally stealing candy from a child. There's no real motive for him being evil, other than he's just bad to the bone. He's so used to getting what he wants, that when something doesn't go his way, he's easy to anger. The devil can go from 1 to 100 in terms of anger, he has no patience, so when Cuphead constantly eludes him, it annoys him to no end, to the point that he's nearly obsessed with him. The devil is very flamboyant and full of himself, which leaves him to be a more performative character, being very over-exaggerated in his expressions and attitude. Unlike most of the villains I've covered, so far the devil doesn't have a grand plan. He's not really doing much scheming, he just does things he feels like doing. He mostly just reacts to things that happen to him. It's not part of a big plan, he's just doing evil things, but that's not necessarily bad. Carpet doesn't really have an overarching plot. It's pretty episodic, so it's important to have a villain who can just roll with whatever's happening. Overall, I'll give the devil a 4 out of 5 for personality because, honestly, he's just enjoyable to watch. He's clearly having fun doing what he does. And he can be more fun to follow than Cuphead sometimes. Cuphead in the show can be a real jerk, so we can really understand the devil's anger. Powers and abilities. The devil's strongest ability is easily his shapeshifting. As mentioned, the devil can pretty much change into anything. He can change into any creature to fight or chase with. But... He can also use it to disguise himself. Normally the form he takes still has the devil's features, but this seems to be by choice. In Season 1, Episode 8, the devil disguises himself as a carnival guy, and he doesn't have any of the devil's signature features. He even changes his voice. Another one of his main powers is the devil's ability to teleport, using his pitchfork. He can teleport anywhere, and might I say, it makes a very satisfying poof when he teleports. <laughs> He also has fire powers, he can shoot and summon fire at will. He also unleashes a fury of uncontrollable fire when he's angry, which results in him unintentionally destroying his finest demons and burning Cuphead's fence. Thanks to your little tantrum, the fence is all burnt up! Yeah! What do you intend to do about that, huh? Nothing! I'm the devil! He can also fly, which is very useful. He also just has some general magic. He can levitate and control objects, which he expertly demonstrates when he paints Cuphead's fence. He can create or summon objects like this cash. I'm not really fully sure of the extent of his power, but he doesn't seem to use it too often. The devil can also steal souls. He just needs to reach over and snatch it up. He also has the standard devil stuff, like contracts. The devil can make deals with people. This can result in situations like Miss Chalice, where he gives her the power to change between a living form and a ghost. So, the devil can grant powers and bring people back to life. The devil is also probably immortal since he's been around forever. 
It's hard to tell if the devil is invincible, since the Cuphead show is so cartoony, literally everyone could survive anything if it's for a bit. It's kind of like Looney Tunes, no one can really die, no matter what they go through, so invincibility is a maybe. I'll give the devil a 4 out of 5 for power, unlike the Lord Commander, there's no drawbacks to his power, but also his power is no compared to villains like Bill, so a 4 out of 5 seems reasonable. Presence. Something kind of surprising is most of the villains I've ranked normally set out as the main villain for a season, they're not normally present as the main big bad in all seasons of the show. The Lord Commander is barely in Season 2 of Final Space, and Toffee has a very small handful of appearances in Star vs. the Forces of Evil. But the Devil is the main threat in all three seasons. There's not really a lot of build-up for the Devil's reveal. There's no hiding in the shadows, he's just there. Despite being the main villain, his episodes are very spread out, so he doesn't always feel very involved, especially in Season 2, where he has only two episodes. So I'll only give the Devil a 2 out of 5 for presence. Effects on the protagonists. While well, yes the Devil scares Cuphead and Mugman when he attacks, <laughs> he honestly doesn't really affect them. I mean half the time they talk about Cuphead owing his soul to the Devil, Cuphead's response is, I ain't too worried about it. So yeah, I don't think Cuphead is losing too much sleep over the threat of the Devil, or at least he isn't after the Devil's third appearance. In the episode, we see Cuphead is having nightmares about the Devil, but thanks to a magic invisible sweater, Cuphead doesn't have to worry about the Devil. You're wearing an impenetrable invisible sweater, but how? Oh. But other than this one exception, I don't think Cuphead cares at all about the threat of the Devil. In fact, honestly, the idea of Cuphead troubles the Devil more, he literally starts hallucinating Cuphead as a taunting figure of the soul that got away. But Cuphead never changes or learns from any of the encounters with the devil. And Mugman is kind of in the same boat. Mugman definitely worries more about the devil, but he worries about everything more. In season 3, the devil has Mugman kidnapped, and Mugman doesn't even show a sign of fear. He has zero concern for the devil's threats and tricks, so I don't think he is deeply affected by the devil. The last character I want to talk about is Miss Chalice. She is very directly affected by the devil. After she passes away, the devil offers her a deal where she can turn from a ghost to a living being. But the cost is she owes the devil a favor. Now, at first, she couldn't care less. But when the devil forces her to betray her friends, she's forced to choose between Cuphead and Mugman or herself. This is the first time she has to care about anyone else. So it's nice to see that the devil can at least cause some character development. But again, that's not really the point of the Cuphead show. It's an episodic series trying to copy the 1930s animation, so it has very little focus on overarching stories and character development. But still, despite this, I'll be giving the devil a low score of 1 out of 5 for effects on the protagonists. Actions. Obviously the devil is evil, but what evil deeds do we see him do? Well first off, in the first episode of the Cuphead show, we see the devil tricking people to go to his con evil to steal their souls. We can see he's stolen 6,299,465,117 souls. <laughs> so yeah, that is pretty evil. Also, in his musical number, he pops a kid's balloon and steals their lollipop. So that's also equally as bad as all the souls. <laughs> now this next one is kind of a stretch. But we could technically blame every war on the devil, since he has some demons in hell, setting up wars. So this is where we do war. But the worst thing he does by a long shot is burns Cuphead's fence. Then later on the devil also accidentally kills his best and second best demons. They probably had families, so I'll count this as a pretty evil deed. After being stressed out, the devil decides to go out and do evil things to make himself feel better. This includes harassing more children by popping their balloons, and that also includes the kid from episode 1. So man, the devil loves punishing this poor bread kid. Come on man, give him a break. He then gets an old lady killed by turning the pigeons she was feeding into a super bird who eats her. Jeez, that's actually just cooked. But oh, he's not done yet. He does the worst thing of all. He messes with traffic. Just think of all the people who will be late for work. And to top it off, he just burns that whole city down. All of this in one day. Man, is he trying to hit a record for most annoying guy in one day. But after all of that, he finally does something to our protagonist, which is kidnap Mugman and holds him for a ransom. Finally, he actually terrorizes the main characters of the show. And as previously mentioned, he forces Miss Chalice to betray Cuphead and Mugman. Now while this seems like a very standard bad guy thing to do, making someone betray their friends, 
It's the way the devil goes about it that makes it terrifying. This is easily the darkest scene in the show. The devil reminds Miss Chalice where she would be without him, and it's not pretty. I think henchmen describe this scene the best. Oh jeez, this seems unnecessarily graphic. This is easily the darkest thing the devil does on screen. It's just so cruel and merciless. It honestly feels out of place how dark it is. Now while this is quite an extensive list of evil deeds, a lot of them are just petty things like bullying kids, which is very bad, but not as evil or as personal as crimes committed by characters like Bellos from the Owl House. Now, I know what you're saying, bro, he's causing every war. Yeah, that's true. That's literally one of the evilest things possible, but it's kind of vague and it's happening off screen and the devil's not directly doing it. So can we give him the credit for this? I'll let you decide on that one. And of course we have the Miss Chalice scene which is really evil, this alone is earning him a point for evil actions. It was just so cruel and dark and unforgettable. And finally the souls. This is probably the evilest thing the devil does, and I won't deny it, but it's too bad he keeps failing at keeping them in his vault. So I'm only going to give him a 3.5 for actions. We just don't often get to see the extent of his evil deeds, and most of the stuff he does on screen is either really petty stuff like annoying kids, or failing to get Cuphead's soul. So, it's hard to give him a high score here, despite the extent of the evil things he does. Conclusion. Does the devil have a good ending? Well, the devil can't really die, so it doesn't really have a conclusive end. In his final encounter with Cuphead and his friends, the devil is utterly humiliated by Miss Chalice in a dancing contest. And then, after that, he repeatedly loses a game of rock, paper, scissors to Cuphead, like an embarrassing amount of times. So, yeah, not really a grand ending, but as the show comes to an end, we get one final tease. The devil has just built his new casino, and while Mugman and Chalice want nothing to do with it, Cuphead races over. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. It gives us a choice of what happens next. The show concluded its run with season 3, so this could be the last we get to see from the show. The creators do seem very open to doing more in the future though, so there is a possibility that this isn't the ending, and we'll end up getting more stories to tell in the Cuphead universe, so it may not be an ending at all, or if the show is concluded, you could connect the show to the game's story. The plot of the Cuphead game revolves around Cuphead losing his soul to the devil at the casino, so you could just say that the game is the next part of the show's story. Yes, it doesn't fit in exactly, yes they are supposed to be different continuities, but you can still get an idea of where the story could be going next. I think it's a really fun ending for a show that didn't need a grand epic conclusion. I love that it leaves room for more Cuphead in the future, and I really love the reference to the game. The show does an amazing job at respecting the source material, but still, it's not much of an ending, so sadly I'll only be giving the devil a 1 out of 5 for his conclusion. The Devil's overall score is 19.5 out of 35, which isn't super high, but still not the worst. The Cuphead show really doesn't call for an overly evil villain. It still needs more of a villain of the week, a character who can go from terrorizing a city to auditioning for a role in a play. So I think the Devil fits very nicely. So in the overall scoring, that leaves us with the Devil in last place with 19.5. Toffee just overtakes him with a score of 20. And finally, on top, with a score of 24, we have the Lord Commander. But now, how do they fit in if I add our previous villain rankings? Still in last place is Gideon with 17.5. Then we have the Collector coming in 8th place with 19 out of 35. The Collector was only just passed by the Devil with only half a point difference. Again, with only another half a point difference, we have Toffee. And just to piss everyone off, we have another half point difference, with the core having a 20.5 out of 35 score. Above the core is his sort of faithful follower, King Andrus, with a 21 out of 35, putting him in 4th place. And finally, in the top 3, we have the Lord Commander, and then Emperor Bellos. Really looks like the dictators are really ruling the rankings here. And finally, still top dog, we have Bill Cipher. Reigning supreme with a total of 29 out of 35, but could that be changing next time with our next lineup of villains? We currently have a very strong contester with the Lich from Adventure Time coming up next video. Thank you again for everyone's patience. I know this video took a really long time to get out. So much has happened in the time between videos. Everything from power outages to getting sick twice and going on holidays. So sorry for all that delay. 
And as I mentioned, I'll be covering the Lich from Adventure Time in the next villain ranking I do, and since he's literally the embodiment of death, I thought I would theme the next video around death, so I'll also be covering the wolf from Puss in Boots 2, and a third villain that I haven't thought of yet, so any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Thank you again for bearing with me, bye.